I want to start off by thanking the organizers for the PD Rhythm 10 for inviting me to give this talk on junctional ectopic tachycardia, evolution and management. These are my disclosures. None of them are pertinent to this discussion. Uh, the goal of this talk is to give a background on JET, uh, the diagnosis and management, uh, present some cases, and then provide a summary of what I think is a management strategy in the modern era. To start off with, this is what I consider the JET family. Um, and I put that in quotation marks. Obviously, we all know about postoperative junctional top tachycardia, the congenital junctional top tachycardia, uh, which obviously by definition occurs at a very young age, and the other junctional top tachycardias that can often be seen in um, children and adolescents. These two in the bottom, the persistent junctional tachycardia and AVNRT, I consider posers. On occasion, AVNRT can have uh, two to one conduction, which then can be confusing with JET. I think most people would uh, be able to make the diagnosis of PJRT and not put it in the JET category. Here are some examples of JET by EKG. In this top left panel, we see a narrow complex tachycardia. You can see in, in lead two here, we have P waves that are seen sometimes and then drop off. And obviously with this variable conduction, one would make the diagnosis of JET. At other times, you can see here's a narrow complex tachycardia and see this P wave, retrograde P wave, uh, just following the QRS complex. And this would be one we consider is this AVRT, is this AVNRT, is this uh, JET. Given a denison, you can see that the P waves then begin marching through the QS, uh, narrow QS complex tachycardia, and this confirms the diagnosis of junctional ectopic tachycardia. Junctional ectopic tachycardia was first described back in 1975 by Kumel and colleagues, and I don't have this original manuscript, even if I did, I, I don't. Uh, read French or speak French. They described seven cases of SVT with AV dissociation, um, all in a younger population, and they described it as an automatic focus in the bundle of Hiss. Um, as uh, pointed out, these appeared at birth at a very young age, and uh, they were felt to be congenital and sometimes familial. In their cases, they were always isolated, having no associated cardiac abnormalities. Uh, Cardiac heart failure is common and obviously more frequently seen in the higher heart rates. Uh, is particularly resistant to uh, treatment, and they use amiodarone most effectively, almost always in combination with digoxin. The dose they use by report, since I don't have the original report, but it subsequently was stated that they use 50 milligrams per kilogram of amiodarone, or 500 milligrams per meter squared, which is obviously much higher than the doses we use today. Uh, the anatomic abnormality in the first case was described as a constricting fibrosis around the main trunk of the bundle of Hiss, quote, reminiscent of those found conditions found in, with atrial ventricular block. Four years later, Garson and Gillette described uh, four patients less than eight weeks of age also having JET, which they described as AV dissociation, unresponsive to DC cardioversion, which makes sense as it's a, it's a automatic rhythm. It was exceedingly difficult to control. And at this point, we did not have amiodarone in the US. It was not FDA approved in the US until 1985. Um, so they use a variety of different medications, which I'll show in the next slide. Two of these four patients died, and they proposed that the JET was due to trauma or it was a hereditary. And here you see in the top corner, a once again, a narrow complex tachycardia. You can see these P waves that are popping up every now and then, but there's uh, AV dissociation. And there's an intracardiac tracing. And in the second from the bottom, you can see the Hiss potentials that precede the QS complexes consistent with JET. In the top right panel, we see the uh, medications used for the four cases across the top. Digoxin was always used. And here we see digoxin and reserpine, which is used for tardive dyskinesia now, and then uh, digoxin and thorazine. They put an E on the effective combination of medications, but you'll see two of the patients die despite being effectively managed. They stated, uh, our data demonstrates that JET is a life-threatening arrhythmia in children. And uh, four years after that, um, Gillette and colleagues descri described three infants with uh, JET and the use of DC cardioversion. Um, one of the patients 
uh, died before being treated and has felt that this, this patient may have died from heart block um, on the amiodarone. The other two were treated with amiodarone with rates, a rate decrease of 10 to 40 beats per minute, so not uh, sufficiently controlled. And they did a HIST bundle ablation, which was accomplished by plugging the selected electrode into a specifically designed plug, which was connected to the front paddle of a front and back paddle set by four large alligator clips. The back paddle was then previously positioned in the left shoulder. A DC cardio version was used. And they what they did is they found the best HIST potential on the HIST electrode array. And those are the ones they used to do the DC ablation. Both patients got heart block, as one might imagine. One actually recovered. Um, since this, and they stated, since this cause of death is not well defined in this dysrhythmia, we feel that extraordinary measures are necessary for the treatment. Obviously, there weren't a lot of options at this time, and DC cardioversion uh, is truly an extraordinary measure. Later on, uh, George Van Hare and colleagues described the use of radio frequency ablation. This was on a 10-month-old diagnosed at birth. Initially, I had a very high rate of 270 beats per minute that had fla failed flecainide and was on amiodarone at 10 per kilo per pranol on digoxin. And the rate only decreased to 220, so it's still quite high. Here you see the narrow complex tachycardia with the P waves marching through. And these are intracardiac tracings with the hisses preceding the QRS complexes. Here you can see they, where they point that out. And what they did is they put, uh, put a catheter, a uh, physiologic catheter across the his area. They looked at for a signal where it had a big A electrogram, a his electrogram, and they hooked that up to the um, radio frequency ablation, which was successful. And here you can see the termination of the jet and this bottom panel. And they state, uh, and George Van Hare is very politically correct. This technique may be safer than high voltage DC shock ablation, particularly in small children. So he kind of tipped his hat to um, Gillette. Later on, there was a series of uh, infants described with JET by uh, a group primarily from Texas. They described 26 infants diagnosed between birth and six months of age. 10 of the children were siblings, four were pairs of non-identical twins, and two infants were cousins. And this would suggest that this may have been an HCN4 channelopathy that's also been discuss discussed in this conference. They described JET as an incessant tachycardia with a normal QRS morphology and AV dissociation. The rates were quite high between uh, with a mean of 230, ranging between 140 to 370, which is wicked fast. Uh, treatment success for which was described as getting a heart rate below 150, was partial in 19, complete in 26, and amiodarone, as previously described, was the most successful. Two of the patients underwent catheter ablation. One of those died. Two, uh, I'm sorry, cryothermal ablation was performed in three. Two were successful and one died. And the overall mortality rate was 35%. And of course, this is the same year that uh, Garson did his radio frequency ablation. Uh, they described medical treatment as probably indicated in all patients with congenital jet, realizing the challenges of uh, DC ablation and radio frequency ablation. And this is probably the largest study on uh, jet written up by uh, the PACES group. It's on pediatric non postoperative junctional top tachycardia, which I think is a, a unique way to describe this population. Um, they def describe JET as a tachycardia regenerating from the AV junction with gradual onset, gradual offset, and rate variability, which is different than what we've seen in the past. Uh, the narrow complex was with AV dissociation and captured sinus beats, and there's oh, could be one-to-one -one VA association. If there's a wide crest complex, the sinus capture beats had to have the same QRS morphology as a wide QRS complex. And the rate for JET was set at greater than 95th percentile for age. They had 94 patients in the study. And you'll see that the dates of the patients that were included range from 1969 to 2008, which means that that study back in Texas, those patients were probably included in this patient population. 20% uh, were familial, just like pointed out in the past by Kumel and others. The age of presentation, 47% were under six months of age. The median rate at presentation was about 210 beats per minute, ranging from 136 to 320. 56% had one-to-one V association. Uh, 
Congestive heart failure was relatively common. If you look at this pie chart below, the most common presentation was a rapid or regular heart rate, but heart failure made up 16% of those presenting symptoms. Antirhythmic medications, 11% uh, had complete success, 70% uh, decreased the rate. The overall mortality, much lower than the past, was 4%, all in those young, uh, those that were diagnosed at a young age. 21% had spontaneous resolution. And the bar graphs on the right, we see those that had incessant jet, which is uh, consistent with a uh, uh, consistent rhythm without any conversion to sinus. Here is sustained, which means that they're in jet more than half the time. And this is episodic where it comes in, goes in and out of it. And the overall jet rate is less than 50%. And what you'll notice is in the dark blue here, that's the number of infants versus the older population. So the vast majority that are incessant are under six months of age. Then as you see, as you get older, and when you go from sustained to episodic, the infant population is much less common. The rate at presentation is shown here. Here is the uh, age and years, and this is the rate you can see, and this actually makes sense, that those that were younger diagnosed at a young age had much higher rates, and as you get older, the jet rate is much slower. These are the medications that were reported to be successful. Once again, amiodarone was the most um, frequently used to be and successful. This next slide goes over the results of the radio frequency ablation crowd thermal ablation attempts in this population. There were 17 that underwent radio frequency ablation and 27 that underwent crowd thermal ablation. These are the other ages and uh, some of the characteristics of the procedure. What I want to point out is the success rate was actually identical or nearly identical between radio frequency ablation and crowd thermal ablation. But what you notice is transient third degree heart block was seen in 6% of the radio frequency and 18% of the crowd thermal, but permanent heart block was inadvertent, was seen in 18% of the radio frequency ablation and none of the crowd thermal ablation patients. And there was recently, uh, just last, this past year, a series of adult JET patients that were represented by numerous institutions. So what you see is uh, it's much more common than pediatric population than the adult population. They described 15 patients, a median of 58 years, and the conclusion criteria that they had to be, die, uh, be over 18 years of age to be included. Radio frequency energy was a predominant source of ablation energy. At 14, one patient underwent uh, crowd thermal ablation. Three of the applications were in the non-coronary cusp. So here's the right coronary cusp, the left coronary cusp. Here's the non-coronary cusp, and here's the central fiber spot, and here's the AV node penetrating uh, near the non-coronary cusp and the right coronary cusp. Their procedural success was 100%, but the recurrence rate was quite high at over half, and heart block was seen in 20%. Uh, of note, they pointed out that no heart block was seen when they applied energy in the non-coronary cusp. And here you can see over here where they applied the energy, uh, these, each of these red dots represent the what they felt was the successful site. These sites up here were those that were applied in the non-coronary cusp. They concluded that catheter ablation for idiopathic jet in adults is associated with a high rate of recurrence requiring multiple procedures and a high risk of AV block requiring pacemaker implantation. In 2006, uh, I looked at a series from uh, University of Iowa and University of Michigan, and we were able to uh, identify six patients ranging between eight to 36 years of age uh, that had JET. Only one patient achieved jet suppression on antirhythmic medication, and that included propranolol, atenolol, digoxin, and sotanolol. We did not use uh, amiodarone in this population. Four of the six patients had procedural success. Um, one patient had transient heart block, but, and, and the procedure was terminated. And five of six had a long-term success. And, and one could ask, well, if four of the six patients had procedural success and five of the six had long-term success, how does that? How do the numbers jive? And it turns out that one of the patients that we cared for at Iowa, we used crowd thermal ablation and the jet rate got slower and slower and slower, but never terminated. And all the other patients, the, the arrhythmia terminated. But on follow-up Holter, the patient was uh, in sinus and has been in sinus since that time. So clearly there was an inflammatory process or I, what I deemed to be an inflammatory process that resolved. And as that resolved, the jet 
uh, went away. And these are the, where we applied the energy. Uh, this is the triangle of cock with a, a coronary sinus here, tricuspid valve here, uh, tendon to Darvo here, and then these are the ablations. You can see most of them are in, closer to the uh, AV node and his potential area. And then in 2017, we presented a larger series, 13 patients, which included some of those original patients, ranging between eight to 36 years of age. Uh, age of diagnosis was zero to 28 years. The mean jet rate was 150 beats per minute, ranging from 100 to 200. Eight were trialed on enterotic medications. Three had dilated left ventricles and one had a dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, of the procedures, eight were under general anesthesia. Eight had spontaneous jet during the procedure. Five required isopaternal. Success was 11 out of 12. And as we uh, stated previously, there's one that had that delayed success. Uh, the unsuccessful patient was subsequently controlled with suppression of the jet on sotalol. And here are the where the applications were delivered. You can see uh, about, uh, I'd say the majority were in the lower portion of the triangle of coke, only two really up in that AV node his area. This slide is a comparison of the of the studies that have actually shown where JET was successful. This is the adult series. Um, once again, the procedure success rate was 100%, recurrence was 53%, heart block was seen in 20%. This is that first series between Iowa and Michigan. Success rate was about 83%, recurrence rate was zero, heart block was zero. And then the procedure success rate in this last series was 92% with no recurrence in heart block. Uh, recently, we had a patient that had a uh, JET and initially it's felt to be secondary to myocarditis. This has now um, been accepted for publication in heart rhythm case reports. As a nine-year-old that presented with myocarditis, he had an elevated BNP and a troponin and a dilated left ventricle. Um, and on presentation, he had a jet rate of 120 on 130 beats per minute. Um, we sent him home and he was still in jet. And I talked to the primary cardiologist that had been caring for him at an outside hospital. And he said that, uh, he had had jet on previous EKGs going back two years. So we thought, well, possibly this was, you know, obviously myocarditis with the elevated uh, cardio uh, biomarkers, but uh, this is probably a more long standing. So we took him to the lab and did a crowd thermal ablation. And here he is in his jet with uh, the V's before the A's. He's in, uh, had AV association here. And then as we apply crowd thermal energy, it gradually shifts to a sinus driven rhythm. But what made this case unique was we actually mapped an area of collision, and I'm going to show you that over here, where we mapped the wavefront collision. And you can see right here, there's a collision, but from what we think is between the slow pathway and the fast, the fast pathway. And at that point right there, that green dot is where the first application terminated the jet. So this termination occurred at this green dot right here. So my thought is obviously that this is originating reading probably from that slow pathway area and this propagation map can help identify that. Uh, back in 2018, there was another unique type of uh, jet. This was an, um, in a 17 year old who had post-exertional palpitations and then also had a documented 4.8 second pause uh, or block. And you can see here, as an example, the tracing they obtained where you've seen that sinus rhythm and then you see the P waves marching through with no significant slowing of the sinus rate, as one might suspect with a vagal event. Here, the P waves just march right through, but we see non-conducted P waves. Uh, they suspected a junctional attack with exit block, which uh, um, obviously is not my first thought, but obviously something we should consider. Um, and uh, flecainide was effective for one year, but after that she became non-compliant and had recurrence of her heart block. So they did an EP study. They did not have any dual AV node physiology. There are no inducible arrhythmias with and without isopaternal. And they did a junctional modification um, performed. They identified an ectopic focus empirically um, based upon clinical experience, localized anatomically by mapping the His bundle and moving the catheter inferiorly where no further His was recognized approximately five meters from the his potential area and broad cryothermal lesions were placed in this area with the freezer max tip. Uh, this eliminated these uh, ectopic uh, 
beats that were causing the heart block concealed down to the ventricle. And there was no recurrence after one year. So uh, here's my summary. Obviously, JET has a variety of forms, the infant JET and the uh, JET uh, as you progress through the ages. Uh, as been shown, congenital JET is much more ominous. Anterodic therapy is relatively less effective compared to SV, other SVTs, but amiodarone is effective in this population, if not lowering the rate, um, terminating the arrhythmia. Radiofrequency ablation procedure has a good success rate, but a high risk of recurrence and heart block. There may be some value of applying energy in the non-coronary cusp. Um, I think we've shown that cryothermal ablation is safe and effective. Um, and as pointed out by that uh, last case report, JET could be considered in, in unusual forms of transient high-grade block. Now, what this has shown me that uh, there's a lot we need to learn here, and you can see by those um, case series that uh, we have not quite figured out the true mechanism of this. I think it's get, uh, an automaticity in the slow pathway area. Uh, but as uh, Winston Churchill pointed out, he's a humble man which must, with much to be humble about. And I think he was referring to many of us as we approach ablation. And when we think we have it down, we realize there's so much more to learn. Um, here are my thoughts about performing cryothermal ablation. If at all possible, avoid anesthesia because the end point is going to be elimination of jet. And if they can uh, present in spontaneous jet or inducible jet with ice return, all that is your best end, uh, end point. Using cryothermal energy, I think, is the energy source of choice. You can test the AV node while freezing. It always seemed ironic to me that one was going to treat jet by creating jet with radiofrequency ablation. The advantage of cryothermal ablation is you can actually see slowing um, um, and you can eliminate the joint from tachycardia. I always start in the mid triangle of Coke. I think this uh, this idea of a propagation map or kind of localizing the um, collision point, which is where the I, I view the slow pathway is. I think one can also use voltage mapping for the same purpose will help you identify where to uh, start applying energy. When I apply cryothermal energy, I look for early success, usually uh, negative tw uh, 20 to 30 degrees once they reach that temperature. If I haven't seen success, then I warm back up again and I uh, move the catheter slightly. Um, and I think the one of the key points here is lack of success may not mean lack of success. And in, in, our, in our one case, we slowed the jet rate and eventually the patient came back um, in sinus rhythm. So they, there must have been some residual inflammatory process contributing to the that slower jet rate. I want to add here, the uh, this is a shameless plug for the University of Iowa. Here's our children's hospital, which is right next to our football stadium. So between the first and second quarter, all the fans wave back to the children's hospital. Uh, two weeks ago, as they wave back to the children's hospital, they're waving to my first grandchild. This is my grandson, Levi, um, who is healthy and uh, um, has a very, very proud grandfather. So. Thank you very much. If you have questions about JET, please feel free to reach out to me. I do not have my email there, but I think it's included in the program packet. So take care, everybody.